Look, we've heard some wonderful stuff this morning, and uh, it's all part of the puzzle, and you'd ha have to say it's uh, uh, countercultural because it's against the ruling philosophies of neoliberalism, etc. And, and what I'm going to talk to you now is equally insurgent or countercultural, and that's the only way we're going to change things, in my view. Uh, so I've been farming for well over 40 years, and uh, I'm an expert on making all the mistakes. Which, um, which is what led me back to university in my late um, 50s to do a PhD, asking why the farmers getting into a new regenerative agriculture had transformatively shifted their mindset and also what they were doing. And I'm currently attached at the Fenner School of Environment and Society, and just down the corridor of people like Will Stephan, world leaders in Earth systems and climate, it's not just climate, there's nine Earth systems. So I'm going to share some of the big picture stuff and show you why I think regenerative agriculture provides uh, wonderful solutions to the, um, both Earth systems and the climate issue. That's our landscape up there, by the way, native grasslands up on the Monero. You can, with healthy, diverse grasslands, put a lot of carbon in the ground. So my message is pretty simple. Um, healthy landscapes, gives us healthy food and fibre, healthy profits to people, and a healthy planet. And I want to walk you through that story. Um, but first of all, we might as well look at where we are. The rats have just discovered they're not in a comfortable place. Um, <laughs> and that's... Uh, and where the rats? Sorry. Uh, so it's undeniable. Uh, that probably accelerating from the 1950s, what's called the Great Acceleration. Our planet has now moved into a new epoch, as you would all know, called the Anthropocene, Anthropo, Human Made. And so on the right, on the left, sorry, is a one-off in the universe, blue-green planet. There's only one, and it's blue-green because life itself created conditions for life. And I won't go into details of that, but it's bacteria put up oxygen for the first time 3.2 billion years ago, etc. So life has created what's now nine self-organising interconnected systems that maintain conditions for life. One species now is starting to destabilise that. That's us. And a bit of a crude comment on the Anthropocene, but that's essentially what we've done. And, you know, you listen to all the stuff of the politics in the last couple of weeks, Endlessly. This issue makes world wars look like storms and teacups. And it gets utter all airplay. <laughs> Except in, in, the, in the enlightened meetings like we've had here today. And Paul Hawken pretty well nailed it. It's fossil capitalism under neoliberalism, endless growth, endless destruction, endless greed has got us to where we are. To the extent our measurement of GDP if you damage the environment and then spend money repairing it, both are incorporated in a GDP measurement of how well we're going. Um, crazy. Can we go back one, um, I'll be talking about Paul Hawke in a minute because I'm beginning to work with him. I think he's a wonderful innovator. Um, I won't make the point here. Uh, I did some work with an aid organisation in the central dry zone of Myanmar, uh, Burma. They've had nearly 20 years climate change already, destabilised monsoon system coming off the Bay of Bengal. That used to be a healthy village community, mixed grasslands and grazing, grow their own vegetables. Uh, the monsoons have dropped 40%, they're vastly irregular. The whole society and landscape has collapsed. So instead of healthy grasslands, you're now left with a few goats chewing thorny scrubs in the rivers of sand rivers. So, I can give you dozens of examples for this. I'm sure there's no sceptics here, but it's real and it's been around and it's getting worse. And it's only one of the Earth systems. And, and so there's about nine. Um, I won't go into the details, you'd be aware of a lot of them. Um, the red and the yellow show, as you'd also be aware that last month, Stefan and 14 colleagues published the latest paper. Uh, they're now saying maybe two decades, uh, we could start moving into hot house earth and possible run runaway events. They're getting very alarmed. 
Um, but as Paul Hawken has said, um, alarmism doesn't change mass mindset. And so positive solutions will. That's why I initiated Drawdown Project. The key point I want to make, and this literature goes back many decades, is that one of the major players in destabilising the Earth systems, most of the Earth systems, not ozone hole, but most of the others, is it, the worst practices of industrial agriculture. But I see that as grounds for hope. Maybe not that horse rider. Um, but the flip side, if industrial agriculture is a big player, a regenerative agriculture that pulls carbon back and that knocks on to the water cycles and land use and biodiversity, it's the big hope and that's what I want to walk you through quickly. So uh, in my PhD, interviewing 18 farmers and a lot more since, and reflecting on my own journey, uh, I tried to cover the spectrum of regenerative agriculture. Um, believe it or not, there's over 30 million hectares of ecological holistic grazing. If you want to heal vast areas of landscape that are degraded and moving to deserts, the only mass way you can do it is with ecological grazing. So animals have a, a role to play. Um, so biological inputs into cropping, cropping into native pastures, You've heard a lot of the permaculture, edible shrubs, biodynamics. So I try to cover the spectrum and in different regions. And then if you think back to where the early uh, white settlers came from in Australia, they came from a young landscape, post-glacial effectively, 10,000, 12,000 year old. Um, the massive glaciers melted, the rocks had been ground down, so their soils were chock full of nutrients and, and it was a humid environment, both within soil and outside. And they come to this place, two thirds of Australia is 3.8 billion, up to 3.8 billion years old. So the, the nutrients have been vastly leached, things like phosphorus. So as a consequence, with millions of years of co-evolution, we have Australian ecologies develop extraordinary methods um, such as under, under the ground, microbially, but also above, of recycling those scarce nutrients and sharing them around, and, and above the ground also. And underneath that, underneath that ancient landscape, because of that process of all those years, is, is a bed of salt. We don't get aerosols coming off the oceans, etc., etc. And so that totally different mindset hit Australia. And 40 years, after clearing 34 years in the West, the salt came up. And I'll tell a story in the book, it took only 15 years to destroy a diverse landscape in Australia that went from lush, soft ground to 20 foot deep gullies, trees falling in and salt. Uh, New England dieback, which a case study I've taught my master's students, um, took 130 years. But eventually, if you pull the rugs out of our ecosystem, the rungs out of the system, they'll go. <coughs> And the other thing which I, we haven't got time to go into, but if you think about the indigenous mind and even the medieval peasant that Bruegel painted here in the 1500s, that they still saw themselves as an indivisible part of mother nature, what you'd call an organic mind. But then that extraordinary process of renaissance, scientific revolution, industrial capitalist revolution, at the end of that four centuries, we end up with a mind it's been called a mechanical, where we now seen as separate, saw ourselves as separate from Earth under, under the rise of modern industrial capitalism. Earth is now a substrate to extract profits from. Hence the Anthropocene, because out of that process came uh, neoliberalism, etc. I just want to touch on this because uh, talking to Indigenous elders who I work with and others, and reading the early um, explorers, surveyors. In 1788, Australia's landscapes were vastly hydrated. They were soft, um, had totally different water structures. We didn't have incised creeks. And the small water cycle, which everyone forgets about, uh, plants were transpiring and, and in that is bacterial aerosols that feed rain. The dews and mists were often heavy right into summer. It's more than a third of your rainfall coming from that. Industrial farming has totally changed it and we've dried out the landscape. And 
I'll just touch briefly on the, on the large water cycle. It's part of the climate thing because water, big ocean currents, big storm cells, etc., this plays a huge role in distributing heat. So it's a key player as well. And I just want to show you, you all know the story where Western agriculture evolved in the Fertile Crescent, Syria, around the Euphrates, etc., and then the, uh, both sides of the Mediterranean. All those countries today, which started off rich, lush, grasslands, forests, rich alluvial flat, they're all desert. Uh, the political scientists will tell you that it's probably a five-year drought triggered the Syrian war, was a key factor. And if you look at the Sahil, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's in perpetual warfare and it's in perpetual drought. So it looks like the two are connected. When I look at six million bare hectares of the Western Australian wet country on sand, spending six months of the year reflecting heat and killing the soil biology, and look at our degraded landscapes, I would argue very powerfully that Australia is now on the same trajectory towards desertification, or in the early stages, and even worse in places. I'm not saying it's causing the modern droughts, but I can tell you it's probably exacerbating it. And I don't go around saying that publicly. We're in drought and, and a lot of friends and clients are, but... <clears throat> and as Plato says, part of that, we've done the same. We've cleared a lot of our forests. He's talking about the hills of Attica, uh, like the skeleton of a sick man, all the fat and soft earth having been wasted away. We've done that in spades as well. <clears throat> So that mechanical mind has delivered uh, industrial agriculture where <coughs> nature is really the enemy. One of the things I looked at was how the uh, big end of town, the big companies, chemical companies, use psychologists to frame their ads. This is an ad for Roundup, glyphosate, I'll touch on that later. Sexy face on the Roundup drum. Language in here, trust your killer instincts. Now, we are being reinforced in the mechanical mind. Anyway, reflecting on my journey, the point I'm trying to get to is I, I, I realised I, I was landscape illiterate. I didn't know how it worked. Dyslexic, if you like. I didn't know that landscape. Uh, should have been in hospital in intensive care. It needed healing. So, at the end of my book, I'm talking to these wonderful farmers and uh, my PhD and... and I decided if I was going to write a book and teach students, how about a simple course in ecological literacy filled with wonderful stories of what's going on? Get rid of a lot of the academic heavy stuff. So, and what's behind it all, of course, and I've got a friend in the audience who was my teacher in the early 70s, Jeremy Evans, the first course in Australia and only the third in the world in holistic thinking. And we learned about paradigms and worldviews. And that's a fence line between two farmers on the Monero, where I come from. The guy on the right, traditional industrial. On the left, moving to ecological. I've stood on both sides of that fence. And as one farmer said, it's all about that square foot of real estate. <coughs> so the model, I'm, not going to, I'm going to illustrate it quickly for you because of time. Look, there's lots of cycles in nature, chemical and others, but you can really simplify it down to these five. Obviously, everything comes from the sun. It is the water cycle, impacted by the sun, carbon in the, in the soil. Soil mineral, soil nutrient cycle. Biodiversity, and then the one that you don't see in the models, this one, uh, our paradigms. The arrows will tell you, you can't interfere with one and damage it without interfering the others. But if you regenerate one, it kick start all the others. So, um, basics of the solar cycle. Get as many little solar panels on your plants as you can. Grab the carbon dioxide, fix sugars, feeds the soil bugs, um, which go and access nutrients for the plants and healthy food. But those soil bugs along with the plants will also bury long-term carbon. We've just been hearing about that all day. Our entire fossil fuel economy is driven by that process. Now, I stayed with this guy in a tough country in the Karoo in South Africa. That's his paddock today on the left of that fence. And his neighbours farming desert on the right. It was desert because of 400 years of mismanagement by the Dutch and the English. 
when Norman started, when he bought that country, he became one of the early clients in ecological grazing. So he set about putting solar panels and diversity onto that, and that's his country today. And he's now running more than three times more and earning more than three times more than when he started before he converted his desert. Um, it's exciting stuff. It's all because of carbon that's buried long term and kickstarts it. And these are some of the new innovations in cropping. In the centre is a photo of industrial traditional cropping. Even at mid stage of the plant, there's a lot of bare ground, sun hitting those soil microbes. I won't go into it. These guys have learnt to drill straight into native pastures. You can do it with what are called your summer active winter dormant carbon four C4s. Um, both of them with the new developments in pasture cropping and no-kill cropping. The basic principle is get more solar panels on your ground for much longer the year to get that carbon going and, and reduce the bare ground. And um, uh, this is now taking off in Australia. It doesn't get the yields, but you slash 95% of your industrial inputs. Because most of them are now doing away without industrial uh, chemicals and, and fertiliser. The water cycle. That blue arrow is the same point in that landscape. This is in Mexico. Uh, that ground overgrazed, rock hard, get a big rain, it all pours off. That's why there's lots of water in the landscape here. It's in the wrong place. So once they've got ecological grazing, um, that's the result 28 years later, whatever it is, um, probably 10,000 times more water in that landscape and more biodiversity, the whole thing. Lots of carbon there. Soil food web, uh, there's a famous, um, we, we've had some wonderful input from American soil scientists like Elaine Ingham. She's got a soil food web, so I redesigned it for Australian conditions. I got sick of looking at squirrels rather than look at a, at a bilby or something. But that's the secret. I, I, I sat in on the university course 40 years apart. I'm still mainly heard physics and chemistry. This is the secret. Active soil biology relates to human health, which I hope we'll have time to touch on briefly. Um, I won't have time to talk about that, but uh, in the uh, 30s, we had our own dust bomb. Out of pastoral country, Broken Hill, Wimmera and Mallee, New South Wales, Western Division, millions of tonnes went up to 4,000 k's, turned the New Zealand Alps red. I know, because I've been climbing up there and saw the red eyes. That's happened on four other occasions. So we're giving our scarcest nutrients to people that keep getting us in football, etc. Well, they've that, got a lot more than we've got. It doesn't make any sense. It's still happening in another way. And that was um, 2010. That's a, a, a stretch of Australia's greatest soils, the Liverpool Plains. And dry season, eight mils of rain. I came through 12 hours later and I saw that. Hopped over the fence, had it with the soil. It was totally capped, there was no structure. <coughs> it had been so over ploughed, so over fertilised, so over sprayed, that rain that should have gone in five minutes was lying there 12 hours later. Um, <laughs> ecological literacy, we just couldn't read it. And I haven't got time, but these guys now, in the face of a huge debt load that's happened in Western Australia with constant droughts and rising costs, at the same time, they've gone from 1,600 acres that they borrow the money for to 30,000 because they switched to a radical new form of biological agriculture, combining worm juice and compost extract. And, uh, and using sheep holistically grazed to stimulate the biology, as the other guys are doing with the new cropping. The yields aren't as much, but their resilience to frost and disease have gone through the roof, and their, their industrial inputs have been slashed 95%. That's why they're profitable. With a healthy, resilient soil. And that's pretty much what happens in the West for five, six months every summer. Fill the silos, feed the sheep, let the sun belt the crap out of the soil. And just quickly, if we put just 1% more carbon in the soil, it's capable, this is some recent research, it's capable of storing over 140,000 litres extra per hectare. Um, it's still no-brainer stuff if we get going. 
And I won't belabor the value of biodiversity that comes, pest control, weed control, shelter for animals, all that sort of stuff. Wonderful group, the agroforestry group out of the Otways. That Australian Post, same one as the benchmark. And they went from 2% here, worried about salt, no production, to 20% of revenge in 24 years. Um, their production went up despite losing 18% of land, and they've stacked on another six or seven commercial enterprises. So their financial, social, environmental resilience gone through the roof. And we're talking about nutrients and micronutrients, so I won't, we haven't got time to get into it. Once you get into vertical shrubs, most of us think horizontally grazing, they have tens of thousands of micro or phytonutrients in them, which the animals, so when we're talking about animals having wisdom, I've worked with a wonderful professor in Utah State and he spent his lifetime studying it. They can detect medicines they need for self-medication or missing nutrients. And there's enough evidence to show um, humans still have that you know, wisdom capacity where we evolve. My kangaroos don't touch the tekasasi. <laughs> and talking about mixed grazing landscape, we don't have to teach the Spanish or Portuguese anything where they're wonderful like the hisses, etc. <clears throat> so just belaboring the point that important to that human social factors, what drives which way we manage the landscape the mechanical mind. And I haven't got time to go into it, but, but so many of the farmers were telling me, my job is to get out of the way of Mother Nature and let her get on with it. And they were actually talking about the, the wonderful concept of self-organisation in nature that's come out of complex adaptive systems thinking recently. That nature has an inbuilt capacity, if she's allowed, and this, if she's disturbed or whatever, to uh, equilibrate back to, to a state of resilience and health, what's called self-organisation. And that's what regenerative agriculture essentially does. It enables that rather than repressing it. So we're getting some numbers on it. I've got to know Paul Hawken, who I have the utmost admiration for. And um, he got sick of talking to climate scientists and saying, what do we do about it? And I said, well, we don't know. We're just measuring how bad it is. So he said, well, bugger. And he went and got 70 top experts and scientists. And this is a result just published. The 100 best, it has been discussed earlier today, the 100 best methods of drawing down carbon or avoiding it going up. And uh, talking to him, when I looked at it, I said, Paul, there's about seven or eight uh, regenerative age ones in there. We've heard about um, uh, plant based foods. I, I didn't even include it, which is a key one too. And I said, if you put them all together and call it regenerative ag, regenerative agriculture is number one by nearly two and a half times in pulling down carbon, over 200 gigatons. And if that's not exciting, I don't know what it is, um, because it relates to human health as well. And the numbers, uh, this is, a, I think, uh, one of the universities in Melbourne, this couple just out of gas, taking their carbon from one to four percent, and they have sequestered more than 11 times their total farm emissions in that period, their fuel and electricity and stuff. It's all helping the climate, plus the others. <clears throat> now, I'll just finish quickly. I want to put some things on your radar about, I will argue powerfully that the rise of the Anthropocene, particularly post-1950, is linked to the massive rise of human ill health, mental and biophysical, in the industrial system. So this is where we evolved, savannas of Africa, probably up to a million years, the modern hominids. Women in hunter-gatherer societies identify well over 500 medicine or food plants. These guys go off hunting. They weren't just hunting meat, they were hunting animals that are also grazed shrubs with tens of thousands of micronutrients, phytochemicals available. And um, we're hardwired, and, the, and our animals, alimentary canal, organs, gut, to detect if we're, if we're missing some of these key resources. <coughs> So, you might have seen that some of you, but it's maybe a new version of where we're going. It's sad but true, we saw some of the stats. You could put an MC on the um, milkshake container on the right if you want. Um, but that's what's happening in, uh, in the developed countries because we're ignoring the importance 
of micronutrients and we're prostituting our food quality. So I'll just quickly give you some, um, how are we going? Okay. The more we drive the industrial systems, go down to dwarf wheats, focused on one thing, maximum production, response to fertilisers and, and irrigation, forget about adaptation to the environment and all the other stuff. Yield goes through the roof, but the research is showing the nutrients have crashed. I mean, we, we, this data has been known since the 50s, um, but now it's emerging in greater detail, and the nu nutrients that are crashing are crucial for our physiological and our immune system function. It's seleniums and manganese and magnesium system. And that's happening across the board in the industrial crops. And, and it's happening in horticulture, fruit, veggies. And I won't go into more detail, but it's the same. Um, we're breeding for production and response to inputs. We're breeding for cosmetics. Um, Anyone who's eaten a um, heritage mulberry or fruit from the 1850s you'll find around the bush still, uh, the taste explodes, your mouth explodes with taste, and that's all the nutrients that are still there. And then you go and eat some of the modern stuff bred for production, it's bland crap, really, by comparison. <clears throat> and that relates to human health, that lack of nutrients. A lot of evidence to show there's a huge connection between the stripping out of the nutrients of the modern foods, and I'm not talking about what the big processors do, so it can store for about eight months on the shelf, let alone sugar, salt, fat, put into it. I'm just talking about the nutrient stripping. And this is a biggie. I've just had, had the pleasure of working with two of the leaders in the world. Kerry Gillen has written the book Whitewash, exposing the cover-ups of cancer by Monsanto and people. And Jonathan Layton, who's got hold of tens of thousands of documents the poison papers that expose the connection between the regulatory authorities, the FDA and the states, and uh, they blindly trust the big chemical companies' data on their tests. And that's uh, basically uh, 80,000 odd poisons in our industrial environment. A very few of them have been properly independently tested. So, this is the world's most widely used herbicide, glyphosate, or Roundup. Many a million tons going up. We know it's connected to GM crops as well. That's why it's estimated. It's water soluble. All the tests are now showing. It's in our groundwater and our freshwater. It's in much of our industrial food. And the more humans are testing in the industrial world, it's in us, it's in breast milk. And it's now having devastating health impacts, which <coughs> more and more research is coming against some difficult opposition, as you would imagine, the editors of, of the journals that are captured by the big end of town, etc. And I'm not going to go into detail because of the time, but the Shikamani pathway is an amino acid production line integral to the microbiome of our gut in developing um, hormones and enzymes as part of the major immune function. It's chopping that off in the later stages in our gut microbiome, that front line of our immune system. The second thing, being water soluble, it's penetrating key linings in our body that stops toxins getting into our bloodstream. Gut lining, blood brain barrier, things like the embryonic and placental membrane. And again, the evidence is now starting to emerge that it could be one of the key players in the modern diseases. Not the key player. Um, and look, this is just correlative evidence. The red line is the takeoff of glyphosate in the 90s, particularly with GM crops when people use, started to use too much of it. The yellow line is, is, is the rise of diseases in the same period, right. mental and biophysical. That's not proof, it's a correlation. But when you see correlations into the 90s, you start saying, well, it's got to be a connection. So, to wrap it up, um, I'm saying that with regenerative agriculture, we know we can do it now with biological inputs. We can get rid of the industrial inputs and some of the worst, or well, all of the worst of the industrial practices. It's doable. It's being done on broad acres. And it's impacting the health of both those things. Uh, and in fact, I'm arguing that it's probably the best method of drawing down carbon, for example, which has not gone effects to all the other, most of the other Earth systems. It's, it's the best way we can do it immediately. So yeah, being dramatic, as a species in the planet, we're on the edge. 
Uh, and if you want to keep breathing the Will Steffens of this world, go and slash the wrists almost. But I, um, I'm more than positive that we can turn it around. Yes, we're part of the problem, but if we enable self-organisation to get going in our healthy landscapes, we can turn it around. This guy, Donald Worcester, had the three principles for good farming. He's a great landscape historian. Making people healthier, promoting a just society, and preserving the earth in its network of life. It's a pretty good ethical philosophy to farm if you're a gardener or a farmer. To follow, I mean. And learning is ever captures it. We, we don't chuck out the best of the mechanical mind. We need the modern science and knowledge. But let's combine it with the old organic mind so that we treasure Mother Earth and turn around this Anthropocene direction. And so I'll finish <coughs> with this quite attributed to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, as you probably know, was shot the second last day of the war deliberately. And he said, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that leads to its children. And that's what us handling the Anthropocene is all about. So I'll leave it there and, and throw it over to Christian. It's a really good question. One of the things I really looked at in my thesis was what triggers transformative change, because you're talking about paradigm shift. And um, there's only one bit of research I found in the world, and that was in transformative learning in the States, and it was almost exactly the same. And that was out of those 80 odd lead farmers I interviewed, men and women. Um, in 60% of the cases, that shifted because of a major life shock. It had to be something like that to crack that character to their mind. Um, burnt in a bushfire, poisoned with self poisoned with chemicals, marriage breakup, you know, whatever. Other big droughts were, for me was the case. Uh, what one farmer said there, the mine cracked. The other 40%, um, some people were more, more naturally biophilic and were open to it or were early adopters, but generally it was a series of little destabilising. Eventually, the mine cracked up. Now, some districts, through um, sociology, and maybe a younger generation or whatever. Although often it's the older fellows that have done the hard yards and can reflect and aren't going home. But some districts have pretty high adoption rate, um, 20% or more. Ours um, is very conservative. A lot of old families, maybe tough environment, I don't know. But there's about a thousand farmers, there's only eight of us doing it. But it's now spreading. There's, there's some really wonderful. Um, education, facilitation, social learning processes going. And I'd say there's probably been 10,000 farmers trained. Standard adoption rates, if you look at the innovation adoption curve, might be 8 or 10%. It's well over 1,000 going. And we're talking about millions of hectares, because a lot of it is broad acre grazing and cropping. The small stuff just as important. And I meant to say the urban food gardening getting involved with uh, what's going on in Melbourne, where my youngest daughter works, that's all part of the picture. Um, and I think this current drought and a few other issues and rising costs, they're the mine crackers that are now coming. And I know in places like Western Australia, what's happening in Western Australia and in the um, Corn Belt in the States, all that chemical and their direct hill technology, um, soils are so dead, there's now a hard pan that far down because there's no long-lived perennials and deep roots that are breaking through. The, the guys that I showed you in Western Australia with their biological system, the power of roots has cracked right through that already and they're accessing nutrients and, and changing soil. So I think the, the, the shocks are coming, which will trigger change. Um, do you have a question over here? Me? Yeah. Um, you your book is an absolute cracker. Um, I should give it to you. Oh, <laughs> I, I borrowed it from the library, read it through, now I've bought the book and I'm studying it page by page. It's an absolute must, I think. 
Um, I'll put so you on commission. Okay. <laughs> What's it called? What? What's it called? Uh, yes, please Ooh. mention the name of it. It's, it's uh, Call of the Reed Warbler, which is uh, a new agriculture, a new earth. It comes from a story in the book where reed warblers return once a person regenerated their creek. Okay, so why is it so difficult? Why is it seen to be so difficult to actually really focus on agriculture as a means to address emissions first? And the other thing is that there's an emerging, emerging uh, view that veganism is the way to go. You know, get rid of the animals. I don't subscribe to that. You know, I come from a dairy farm myself. Um, I think animals have a very important role in the system. Could you just talk a bit more about both of those things, please? The first one was... Uh, the, uh, why is it so difficult for yeah. the power brokers to actually, you know, focus on that? Well, you put your finger on it. Um, the neoliberal economic growth, endless greed, destruction thing penetrates the entire society. So from the government down, your, your um, departments, policy, your universities, your ag colleges, uh, even if we had that, and we did have in some of the departments, um, agronomists on side with healthy soil that came out of the uh, 30s and the old um, soil conservation. They're all gone. So guess who's fogging chemicals? It's a, it's a chemical company reps. So the power is enormous and uh, people don't know how to do it. Their peers are doing it and um, it's an enormous social political pressure would be the main factor in addition to the paradigm thing which is in culture. You know, obviously it in inculcates you deeply in it. On the vegan thing, look, my, my personal view is people's food choices is entirely up to them. Um, and I don't think anyone should be condemned for <coughs> the range of reasons you do it. I, I would argue that we need animals to regenerate the broad la grazing landscapes, many of which are desert. You saw some of the photos. I could show you lots more in Australia that are dramatic. And there's certain things that a, a careful diet is needed if you're vegan or even vegetarian. Things like vitamin B12 need to come out of a ruminant stomach. And talking to, I was at Sydney Uni yesterday and a professor there in the Department of Planetary and Human Health works in the developing world and she works with um, uh, a lot of those sort of peasant farming uh, agriculture people and, and iron that comes out of animals, heme iron, is 10 times more absorbable, absorbable than iron out of vegetables. So there's just a few things to be wary of. But I would argue, and, and another part of this story, probably digging yourself in deep here, but um, is there's about 1.5 billion um, developing world people in marginal countries, totally developing, dependent on their animals for milk, fibre, even fuel, out of the dung, etc. And um, what are they going to do? You know. So, and we co-evolved to eat aspects of meat. I in no way condone the industrial meat the cafe is what Poland talks about, concentrated animals. I think they're morally in every other way repugnant. That should all go. And those the chicken results we saw with an early talk, you know, all that industrial crap should go. And then health would change overnight and that would bring down those levels of meat. But healthy grazing meats on healthy landscapes will have a huge range of micro and normal minerals that you won't access in many ways. So you know, we could go on for hours. It's a really complex issue, but the key message is people's personal eating preferences entirely up to them. That's probably good reasons for all of it. But don't ignore some of the key things we co evolved for, would be my right on um, In about three years, we've um, given up meat and taken up trying to learn how to garden. And after Julia's done so much reading, I've discovered that I, my gut, is like a tree in a sense, that it takes about six months to actually get your gut biome up to the stage. So not only do we try to put um, animal product in our ground and learn to put carbon and water in it, and we're not very good at the gardening yet, but when I've got to have mixed herbs, um, eat all the plants in our garden, um, my health, I have arthritis, I'm putting off my hip replacements and it's just incredible to actually understand that I am like a plant rooted. And, and mm. can you elaborate on that? Because I think you were talking, I want to talk about it a bit. 
No, look, I think it's a great story. We, uh, we, you know, what, what lives in here um, is nearly the weight of our brain, but there's millions of times more DNA working away there, and, and it's, it's such a crucial role um, in our whole physiological function. So what we feed, put into there, um, determines um, how that functions and then what, what we get out of it. So I think you're talking about acclimatising your stomach across as you shifted. So uh, uh, yeah, the message would be don't go cold turkey. If you want to go to a totally plant-based diet or whatever, um, do it carefully or, or, or source your replacement minerals that you might that, uh, you lose from the meats. Do it carefully so that your whole gut microbiome can adjust. But by the same token, uh, your gut microbiome will turn over in about three days. That's the death rate of all the bugs. So it, 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 it can shift quite quickly, and if you go putting in a lot of junk food, it can shift equally quickly. So it's such a complex area. There's probably people in here know a lot more about it than I do, but um, let's think biologically and not mechanically is, is the message.